Good day, trenders. Hello and welcome to yet another exciting edition of Trends Travel. I'm your host for today, Louise Scoble, and tonight we're coming to you from Food Truck Fridays at the Wanderers Club. We will be telling you a lot more about that later on, but right now, let's see what we have on the lineup. Coming up next on Trends Travel this week, we listen to Golden Classics at Golden Gate. Food trucks are a big trend this season. In our third segment, we look at the fascinating world of the arts. And finally, the mystical world of the Dogon tribe and astrology. All this and so much more on Trends Travel this week. In the picturesque landscapes of Golden Gate National Park in the Free State, we attended a launch of an event that is a first of its kind in the country. Golden Gate refers to the sandstone cliffs found on either side of the valley at the Golden Gate Dam, and it was the most magical concert call you could ever imagine. The first night was dedicated to the eclectic sound of famous jazz voices such as Gloria Bosman and Timothy Malloy. The weather tried to dull this event, but it was no match for great music echoing off the golden cliffs of the Golden Gate Valley. parks. Uh, Golden Gate is one of our most beautiful parks. It's, it's the only Highland Park we have and we just get a sense looking at the numbers that a lot of people don't know as much about this park as they should. They're not visiting in the numbers that we expect and we wanted to do something different to say to our potential clients out there that parks are not just about seeing the big five. This is about uh, you can come to a park to relax, to just enjoy the landscape. You can even have a musical event as we're having here. So we are multifaceted in that way. And in doing events like this, that's what we're trying to demonstrate, that we're multifaceted and we serve, we've got 19 parks across the country and each one has got a very specific niche that it serves and it attracts. And here we're, more, we're trying to attract a more urban market because you know this is three hours away from Gauteng. So our target market is primarily Gauteng, so Johannesburg, Pretoria, but we also have Bloemfontein which is not too far away. And strangely enough, Durban as well is equidistant to uh, between Johannesburg, Golden Gate, and, this, um, and, and, and Bloemfontein. So it's an ideally situated park in that way. Well, you know, we're turning, we're turning slowly. We, we're trying to avoid sudden turns because we have a solid and very loyal market that we do not want to, um, to push away as well. So what we're trying to do is trying to find a measure between or finding an equilibrium between old markets and new markets. So this is not, this is not too radical because it's a jazz and classical music event. So it does cut across quite a number of, of market segments. It's, it's not exactly very radical departure. We have, we have not jumped or made a leap towards, let's say, um, a DJ on the stage. So it's, it's a very gradual turn that we're taking. But we'll never fully, ever fully, um, how can I put it, 
become something different. We will always be guided by conservation principles. And that, that's, what it, that's why we also have very intimate events. So we cannot, for example, have an event for 5,000 people in such pristine grounds. But tomorrow you will see the classical concert. I mean, that is the pinnacle of it. And why classical music? We wanted something that people would talk about a little bit more because everybody is so used to a certain type of genre. But we just said classical, and not only classical, but we want black soloists. So let's see how tomorrow goes as well. <laughs> With those sweet sounds, day one ended with a promise of much more to come. Day two arrived and it only got better, as an outdoor stage was set up to take full advantage of the acoustics of the mountain amphitheater. Network between Big names like Total and F&B were proud sponsors to this event. We look after history. Total has been a, a sponsor and a partner for Sun Parks for many, many, many years. In fact, uh, we'll be celebrating next year the 60th anniversary of our partnership. So 60 years, it's a long wedding uh, and a beautiful one. And part of the activities we are going uh, to do together and reinforce is that kind of activities, the, the, the Golden Classics. I think it's a unique uh, opportunity, it's a unique uh, venue. Um, there will be some very, very talented uh, stars singing tonight and playing tonight. And it's a nice way to, to bring together the family of uh, Sun Parks, Total, and, and FNB, who is also the other sponsor. And uh, I think it's just part of the good relationship and partnership that we build together. Part of uh, what we are doing, uh, generally speaking, in the world is, is turned towards uh, culture. Culture is, um, is like uh, energy. You need it to grow and to develop and to develop the people and talents. And uh, we believe in this and bringing together uh, the people, the culture and within this park, which is a, a unique place. Uh, in fact, music is in nature. So somehow we are just bringing together some elements which already uh, existed. Well, major, I think there are two major pro uh, 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 reasons why we're actually getting behind this particular project. Firstly, we want to showcase uh, this particular national park, the Golden Gate. As you see that the Golden Gate has got a very, very rich heritage. At the same time, it's one of the good gems uh, that Sand Parks has got in their stable. And, and, and I think lastly, we want to also like encourage the young uh, classic players and young classic musicians uh, to can contribute as well uh, in uh, tourism and in national heritage. This is an idea that we're supposed to have embraced long time ago because we are managing a system of national parks, a system that connects society. We are not about the big five. We are about heritage also. We are about the art. We are about the voices of the people. Therefore, music is relevant to talk to the people of South Africa, to talk to the people of the world about these parks. If you look at the history of conservation, even the instruments that are used to produce music are from the environment, are from nature. Therefore, by doing this, we are saying Sand parks will remain relevant. Sand parks will always attract new clients to the system. We always say we want to grow our own timber. We want young people to come to parks, not to say I'm there to watch the big five. They must come and listen to this. Therefore, we're about that, we want to be relevant, we want to become more relevant.
l'amor, el amor. Al di che li se vivere. better way to end an awesome evening but with a warm hearty South African meal and of course great wine. It was a resounding success and we hope to see you again in 2018. but the weather's really not playing along so without further ado we'll take you all into what food truck friday is all about we also stop in india as well as in albania where a church in ruins is attracting so many tourists trends travel headed through to wondrous club for a taste explosion at the introduction of the very first food truck fridays essentially what i wanted to do was create an atmosphere where people after work would come and have a nice relaxing day after a hard week that kind of thing and essentially this is what's uh, come from that um yeah i mean it's just about coming having a good time having a good meal having a drink and it's family friendly just relaxing and having a good time that's about it with the amazing culinary foods that have come out of the food truck industry this event brings together some of the best food trucks in the business i have a number of events that I've like kind of done. Um, I've also got a portal that I've essentially got uh, a lot of the guys listed on and I've made contact with them and I've said listen this is what the plan is and they've already you know they pretty much jumped on board and it's really just growing from there and it's growing more and more each day. The event is free and is an experience of incredible delights that is amped to be a monthly pop-up showcase of food trucks from across the country at various venues both in and around Gauteng and moving to other provinces as well. Currently at the Wonders Club, we're doing it on the first Friday of every month for the rest of the year. Um, I've got uh, Sally Mustang Custom Tattoos in Santon as another venue. We've got the Design Court in Four Ways as a venue. Um, so what's essentially going to happen, we'll have it at different locations um, it, throughout the month, obviously not on the same day, and we'll grow it from there. And um, my long-term goals for, with Food Truck Fridays is to have it on, um, you know, every single day of the, uh, every single Friday, and then from there we go to Durban, Cape Town, and Pretoria as well. With special appearances from local craft beers, craft gin, and many more, one can also enjoy the subtle sounds of live music with an array of dishes to choose from, making it heaven for your palate. I have to admit that I kind of do like the craft beer guys, but the gin guys, are this, you know, that's also one of the things that are really making an impact on the, in the industry, as well as your, um, you know, craft, uh, like Tipitinto type of um, rum and raspberry, that kind of thing, that's also making a comeback, uh, well, it's really becoming popular. So, but yeah, I mean, the bottom line is, I think the craft beers are really something that's unique. Speaking of craft beers and gin, our first stop was the genologist. Okay, so he's making genologist floral gin. The way we make genologist floral gin is that we start off by utilizing a little bit of rosemary. Now, most gardens have rosemary, so you just have to walk out of your back door to your garden, pull some rosemary, throw it in. Because it's floral, it means that it's fairly perfumed. Now, you want a herbaceous, but yet at the same time, you want to bring the flavor back a little bit and just make it more acceptable. Now, on top of that, we throw in blueberries and raspberry. Blueberries are mostly for color because once they get mixed into the gin, they go pink. Secondly, raspberry for flavor. So now you've got the makings of almost a perfect gin. 
Into that, we throw in pitch and leads. We believe in pitch and leads for two reasons. Reason number one, the amount of sugar in pitch and leads is considerably lower. Number two, the flavor is milder because we want the flavor of the gin to come through because we've spent a hell of a lot of time and effort getting the gin right. We don't want to kill it with tonic that's just over the top. And what you have, you have the normal pitch and leads, but in this case, we utilize the pink pitch and leads, which is rose water and a little bit of cucumber. And it works beautifully together. So you've got this really, really beautiful pink drink. And guess what? Even guys drink pink drinks. And that looks perfect. Okay, great. I'm going to give it a bit of a taste. And while I do that, can you tell me what is genealogy? Okay, so genealogist is a very scientifically based gin. If you have a look, the corks come from Portugal. Our bottles, you can see how sexy they are. They're from France, but the gin's from Gauteng. Mm -hmm. So we, we, are, we are predominantly scientific in our approach. We all consist, the coal company consists of either lawyers or, or, or uh, engineers. Okay. So you can imagine the lawyers do all the talking. I'm one of those. And then you have the engineers. They're going to do things just like this, just like this, just like this. And we follow very scientific principles because to really make a good drink, You've got to be able to get it right every time, not just once. Because, you know, if, you don't, if you're not consistent, the market's going to kill you. But do me a favor, have another sip. I like the fact that it's not too overwhelming because I'm not really a drinker. So it's not too overwhelming, but you can still taste. And I can taste the rosemary too. And you know what else you can taste? What? Can you get that hint of Turkish delight in there? We use roast geranium, and that is also the taste of Turkish delight. Okay, great. So, thank you. something. So look out for them. Yes, thank you. The great thing about food trucks is that anyone can do it, as we discovered when we met her with Nyasha Lunga from No Filter Coffee. Lunga, an accountant by profession, started No Filter after deciding that she wanted more flexible hours after becoming a mom. So guys, I'm cheating. I'm on the inside of No Filter Coffee. What is No Filter Coffee? No Filter Coffee is 100% pure Arabica beans. And we sell cappuccinos, lattes, hot chocolates, crushes, iced coffees. So I do see you have a couple of, you've got a range of flavors happening there. What are those flavors? Absolutely. We've got salted caramel, hazelnut. We've got gingerbread, which is our new flavor at the moment. And we've also got vanilla. Um, I, you guys, I think I'm going to try the gingerbread. It sounds really good. So I'll try the gingerbread, but you've also got like these amazing cupcakes. What's happening there? Absolutely. We've got this amazing lady that's doing these cupcakes for us. We've got red velvet, vanilla, and chocolate. Absolutely divine. So you should try. I'd recommend chocolate. So guys, I'm going to try it. So here we go. It's hot, but it tastes like Christmas. But I'm also going to try this delicious cupcake. So I have here, I have a vanilla. Let's go do this. Guys. Mm, really, really good. You should try it. With so much excellent grub to choose from, we decided to go for the big red fire truck, which had the longest line, so it must be good. Engine 67 is a 1950s Bedford fire engine food truck serving handcrafted burgers, seasoned and grilled to perfection, using fresh, never frozen, certified grass-fed beef. So not only is it tasty, but healthier too. Okay guys, I'm gonna try and steal two minutes here with Trevor. It's super busy right now. So Trevor, tell me, what, where are we? What do we have here? I've got engine 67. Uh, we've been around for about two and a half years and uh, yeah, humming over here this evening. It's been uh, very fortunate with the uh, Food Truck Fridays. Okay, and what is exactly that you serve? We do uh, tacos, burgers, and uh, gourmet tacos and burgers. Uh, only the best quality rump, best beef ingredients, and uh, organic uh, lettuce, tomatoes, onions, all the rest. And how did you get started? I've been in restaurants for many, many years, and uh, a growing evolution was food trucks. So yeah, food trucks was the uh, the next best thing, I suppose. Now your stall is absolutely full. There's a million people waiting in line, so I won't keep you any longer. But what is your most popular item? My beef rump taco. Would you like to try some? I would love to try some. Give me a short moment. Let me get some. Would you like a beef rump taco or just to try some of the beef? Up to you. Hmm, I think I would. I want the, the, the whole deal. The whole deal? Yeah. Excellent. Let's get that going for you right away. Great. Give me Thank a moment. you. Great. One beef taco, small beef taco. I'm getting a beef taco. <laughs> While I wait for my beef taco, the crowd gets larger and larger and the orders just keep pouring in. Okay. Guys, I'm about to try my beef tacos. I'm going to hand this to him and he's going to hand this to me. There you go. There we go. I hope you enjoy that. I'm... Because <laughs> I'm special. <laughs> hey! 
Thank you. How are you enjoying that? Nice soft tender beef rump with some cheddar and mozzarella cheese and uh, all to go. I hope you enjoy it. And solely worth the wait, guys. Thank you so much, Trevor. Pleasure. I'm going to take my thing and go away in, in a quiet corner and eat it by myself. <laughs> Thank you. As promised, the taco is tender and soft. A melt in your mouth can I have another kind of feeling. The next edition of this event looks to be just as exciting as this one, and it seems that Food Truck Fridays is going to be a regular monthly event on the last Friday of every month. are art, even mixing drink is art. So right now we take it to the world of art. Peter Alex is sketching his latest exclusive masterpiece in Lagos. A portrait of Nigeria's president, Muhammadu Buhari. One of the famous African personalities he has worked on. Sketching different kinds of art has been his hobby since he was three years old. Now at 25, he continues to perfect his artistic skills on sketchboards and canvas. I started drawing on the floor and I, I just uh, carry um, like just anything, I just draw on the floor like that. So with time, I started doing uh, cartoons. You know, every kid they love drawing cartoons, comics and all that. So I want to join the more you do, the more you improve, you understand. So I kept doing that just like that. and. Um, in my school, they, they taught us fine art, and I also love researching more on some things like that. So that's how I just felt like, okay, uh, this is, I, I, just, I just love art. Peter chose pyrography as his niche, a technique that decorates wood or other materials using barn masks. Afterwards, he uses razor blade to carve out the sketchboard, giving the image various textures, color, and optical illusions. At times, he also uses sandpaper to fill up the different shades and give his work a smooth finish. They are then sprayed with fixative to stop the colors from running. So far, he has held two fruitful exhibitions, selling his art pieces for between 170 and 2,800 US dollars within Lagos. Their feedback towards this paragraphy art is it's really encouraging and really, really awesome because they always, like as a company gave me a commission recently, they say they've seen so many ads and they have lots of ads, but since they saw this one I use, um, razor blade on wood, they want to like, they want to see, they want something rare and unique. So when I did the work and they saw it, they were like, you mean you did this? Like they were like, wow, wow. So that's, their expressions and our feedbacks towards the work are like positive. Timmy O'K, okay, an art collector, saw Peter's pieces posted on social media. He currently owns some of them in his collection, including his favorite, Twist of Fate. Look at expressions that appeal to me. I look for expressions that I can resonate with. And um, Alex's piece, The Twist of Fate, when I saw it, I immediately loved it. The technique stood out because it's not a technique that is common as well. And then when I spoke to him about the literature and the motivation behind it, you know, he told me it's called The Twist of Fate. And it simply says that, you know, life is unpredictable. And um, sometimes a journey can just take a twist of fate and it will just be everything you've been hoping for. And I mean, that resonated with me, that resonated with my life journey, so I just knew I had to. Peter was training to be an accountant when he realized his destined path. The passion was too strong, like too strong. So I really want to, even art students, sometimes in my schools, I, they normally take me for competition. I'm not in art class, but they will still come to my class and take me for. So sometimes I get some little idea from my, from those competitions and all that. So that's how I just kept getting improved, improved like that. And, was practicing. Currently, he's working on plans to start an art school and a gallery to help promote pyrography. In a studio in New York's Brooklyn Dumbo neighborhood, 
painter Eric Lopresto is hard at work creating landscapes that are often not seen in popular artwork. He paints nuclear weapon testing site and the environment to bring more understanding and help deal with fear that nuclear weapons elicit. This is actually what nuclear tests usually look like in, in the U.S. in any way. They don't look like mushroom clouds or they didn't. Lord Presti grew up in the eastern Washington state near the Hanford side, which made plutonium. His father worked on post blow up cleanups. Le Presto says nuclear weapons were created by people with high ethical standards who truly wanted to help the humankind and therefore are expressions of creativity that he wants to explore. And these things are something that we've created as a culture that are incredibly dangerous, but they're also emblems of our highest hopes for world peace. So in a way, as an artist, um, and I'm not a policymaker, I'm not a politician, I'm not a scientist, but as an artist, I'm inclined to see these things as things that people created, that groups of people who are um, ethically uh, inclined, who are ambitious, engineers, scientists, who are trying to do their very best, they put together these things, and I think that in some ways that makes them um, artifacts of creativity, just as much as paintings are. La Presti's paintings investigate the cultural after effects of dramatic conflicts, focusing on the aftermath of the Cold War and its associated landscapes. So in a very real way, nuclear weapons are about display. They work on the mind of the person who are viewing them. As an artist, that's very close to what I do as a painter. So I think of painting more than just a um, object to put above the couch. It's a tool for adjusting our eyes. And so in that way, nuclear weapons and paintings, I see them as somewhat analogous. He adds he hopes for the letter. They are um, terrifying, and yet they are somewhat paradoxical. Um, they've been around for a while, but they seem to have these sides where they will either destroy the world or they'll never be used. So as an artist, I find that very interesting. I think also they're somewhat misunderstood. Our image of nuclear weapons is somewhat misunderstood, and for an artist, you know, all I am about is, is uh, uh, visualizing things that are hard to, to understand. The artist is not new to the art world. In 2010, he has exhibited one of the most intriguing body of works titled Super Bloom, which focuses on the existence of plants and flowers, which grows after the nuclear weapon have exploded. Well, everyone thinks of a mushroom cloud, right? But ac actually, most nuclear weapons tests are underground, even the ones in North Korea are underground. As a culture, we really don't have a good image of what that is. And as a painter, when something so important seems to have no visualization in the cultural imagination, that's where I feel I can step in and bring something to the table because what I do is visualize things. Lopresti's abstract work have sparked interest not only in artists, but scientists, engineers, and politicians who of course collect these artworks. Most of my paintings, including this one behind me, is in Nevada, where there is a very large nuclear test site called Nevada Test Site. It's um, scattered with over a thousand nuclear craters. And the thing that was very surprising to me was how few people, including myself, were aware of this landscape or how big it was. It's kind of like the Grand Canyon. It's a quintessential American landscape that somehow we don't know about. Lord Presley will show his works in April until May in an exhibition called An Ocean of Light at the Benning Water Gallery in New York.
Mexico City market that never sleeps, the Central de Abasto that sells some 30,000 tons of daily produce and merchandise will now be providing a brand new offering. To mark the market's 35 years of business, the We Do Things Collective has organized the world's central project that is looking to beautify the market's exterior with 32 murals designed by both Mexican nationals and international artists. México es folclore, es gente, es cultura y es comida y es muchas otras cosas. La central de abasto es en 327 hectáreas contiene a nuestro país. Por eso es que nosotros buscamos este espacio y decidimos que aquí queríamos que se hiciera el primer proyecto de central de muros para demostrar que el muralismo mexicano sigue existiendo, que está vigente y que aparte puede ser un mecanismo de transformación para la sociedad. The Central de Abasto is Mexico City's main wholesale market for produce and other foodstuffs that run similarly to traditional public markets. Estamos en el lugar del país en donde viene, yo creo, la mayor diversidad cultural de, de, todo, de todo el país llega aquí a la Central de Abasto y es muy meritorio que aquí la gente tenga una opción cultural, que no solamente estemos pensando que el arte tiene que estar en ciudades como Nueva York o en Miami o en Berlín, en las grandes ciudades europeas, sino que el arte puede estar en Iztapalapa, en la Central de Abasto de la Ciudad de México. ¿no? The facility is currently located on a property that extends 327 hectares. Es que estamos viviendo una explosión del nuevo muralismo mexicano, donde la expresión no importa tanto los conceptos, sino el poder de la mano, el poder del dibujo y cómo estamos cubriendo muros con ese mismo espíritu que hicieron Diego Orozco y Siqueiros, pero ahora a través de la rebeldía de la gente que está haciendo murales en las calles y que básicamente está llevando que eso que antes era lo mejor de pandillas a un mecanismo de expresión urbana en el que todos participamos y embellecemos la ciudad. With more than 2,000 businesses selling produce from the far reaches of the country, ranging from exotic indigenous offerings, from Chiapas traditional fruits brought over by the European migrants. Produce sold here represents 80% of the consumption of the country's megalopolis. The new generation of Mexican artists are keen to show the country's muralistic legacies of Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and Jose Clement Orozzo live on in 2018. Many old Albanian Orthodox churches and the art they contain lie in ruins due to decades of neglect, but they could attract tourists if they are repaired, experts say. The government and the Orthodox Church itself have now started restoring some of the structures, many of which date from the Byzantine period. The churches are often in picturesque locations and their fortunes reflect the twists of the Albanian politics over the last century. Albania became a functioning state after World War I, after domination under the Ottoman Empire. U shpallur si monument, u shpallur dhe në mbrojti. Se sa në mbrojti është, ju e shikoni. Êshtë një gjendi të shtuse për këtë gjendi në cilë ndodhës kjo monument. Albania became communist after World War II, but embraced democracy in 1990 and now aspires to join the European Union. Hoxha e banë të manastirin, se brojti ka shteti, berisha dhe ramë, rëzonë dhe kisha të tëra. The post-Byzantine saint Athanasius Church in Leshnika is one example. Its frescoes have stared at the stars since last May when the roof caved in and its southern wall fell down. The church has plastic sheets all over its walls for protection while debris lies outside the building. Local Yorgo Sheka says the church was taken care as a cultural shrine under late dictator Enver Hoxha, who was a hardline Stalinist, but has been neglected ever since. Hoxha banned religion in the 1960s and destroyed many churches and mosques, but he did keep some of their art. The church at Labova of the Cross is in far better condition due to its location in their village and fame due to a special cross. The cross is made from solid gold and carved from wood apparently from the cross Christ died on as a gift from the Byzantine Emperor Justinian. Show's almost over.
over, but we do have a little bit more left for you. Right now, it's already the United Arab Emirates where they've launched the world's longest zip line. The world's longest zip line will open in the United Arab Emirates on Friday, propelling thrill seekers at speeds of up to 150 kilometers an hour down the Middle East country's highest mountain peak. <laughs> Now that I'm here, I can actually all see the way down there. And now I'm really excited to try it. Hopefully, it's going to defy my expectations, like I said earlier. And it looks like a lot of fun. Most visitors to the UAE spend the time in Dubai, home to one of the world's largest shopping centers and an indoor ski slope. They hope the zip line starting 1,680 meters above sea level on top of the Jabal Jai mountain will draw in tourists. Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing. Don't know, concentrate on the fantastic view or go faster. You have to do it two, three times. The view and the mountains is really cool. I will do it again. <laughs> Today, we were here to verify the longest zip wire. The minimum to achieve this record was 2,205 meters. Today, Ras Al Khaimah Tourism Development Authority and Toro Verde were able to achieve 2,831.88 meters, and they were officially amazing. And I can confirm that Jabal J's flight is the longest zip wire in the world. The suspended platform is also very unique. It's, it's the first of its kind that's ever done in the world. It is a uh, nine and a half ton platform with a glass bottom that's anchored with eight anchors into the mountains, uh, but it also offers a smooth arrival and landing for the flyers on the zip line. The UAE's latest record will be added to a mantle of achievements that includes the world's tallest building and artificial palm-shaped islands. Sticks in silk robes and skull beads, soothsayers with crystal balls and fortune tellers with parrots. Erasmus of faith healers has converged on the Indian capital for a week-long astrological fair where they are guiding the faithful to life of eternal happiness. So, parrot is a kind of bird that is known by the mind, the mind, and the mind, the mind, the mind, the mind. इस माध्यम से इसका सगुन माना जाता है, तो इसके जरिए मैं प्रोडक्शन करता हूँ। Conjuring up a mystical aura, dozens of soothsayers have gathered under one roof to alleviate marital discords, financial problems, academic dilemmas as they play spiritual guides and agony aunts to thousands of visitors who flock to the fair every day. ये मैथमेटिक्स है, सारी कैलकुलेशंस हैं। हम पहले दिन के बच्चे को, एक दिन के बच्चे को हम ये बता सकते हैं कि वो जीवन में क्या तो बनेगा, क्या करेगा। इसको जीवन में किस उम्र पर या इसको कौन सी बीमारी आ सकती है, ये चीज़ से हमें ऐसे बचा के रखना है। ये सारी चीज़ें हम अगर ये साइंस नहीं है तो इतने ईयर ये दिक्कत आएगी, ये सारे सारे कैलकुलेशन हैं। The fair that is now a decade-old affair brings together palmists, vastu consultants, feng shui experts, reiki practitioners, and pranic healers, along with the more orthodox astrologers, palmists, and tarot card readers every January. 
Indians rely on Vedic astrology, which dates back to ancient Hindu texts, to set dates and times not just for weddings but also for buying a car or even moving house. Astrology for many people around the world is a pastime, an activity that many people deride as a pseudoscience. Still, many Indians visit astrologers, palm readers, numerologists and tarot card readers for advice on marriage and career. अलग अलग सक्सेस के लिए है कोई स्टोन कोई पेंडेंट फाइनेंस के लिए है अलग अलग चीजों के लिए हर एक चीज है उससे सबको बेनिफिट मिलता है करियर ग्रोथ के लिए है एजुकेशन के लिए है कंसंट्रेशन स्ट्रांग करने के लिए है डिफरेंट सो मेनी हैव फाइनेंस इन हियर यस एस्ट्रोलॉजी इज वेरी एंशिएंट साइंस आई डू बिलीव इट Some of the methods can be really bizarre, with parrots being used to pick cards that tell and predict the future love life of a person, to the signature style of a person foretelling his financial success. And they believe that they are proponents of a special art which not only shows the right path forward, but also helps keep sanity in an increasingly insane world. The whole and sole purpose of Uh, predicting future is to make the person optimistic and positive about his or her own life we should know our destination we should choose the right path and we should know the timing of events also For thousands of years, astrologers and pundits have been predicting the future by making kundlis, a graphical representation of planets based on the time, date, and place of one's birth. Similar charts and software have evolved over the years for stock indexes as well. Dancers from Mali's Dogon community are believed to carry the souls of those that have passed away and their movements a way to honor the spirit world. The symbols and dancing were a highlight of the Dogon festival held in Mali's capital Bamako in January. The Dogon people are known for their mythology, mask dancers, wooden sculptures and architecture. The festival used to be a major cultural event drawing thousands of local and international tourists but has struggled to maintain popularity due to political turmoil and insecurity in northern Mali. Voilà, euh, ce festival euh, est un festival qui fait la promotion de la diversité du patrimoine culturel de Gon. Le pays de Gon est très large, il y a la musique, il y a la danse, il y a la gastronomie, il y a l'habillement, le textile. Nous sommes venus promouvoir ce que nous avons de meilleur, ce que nous avons de beau. C'est-à-dire pendant une semaine sans aller au pays de Gon, on a le pays de Gon à Bamako. <rire> The Dogon Festival is one of the several efforts to boost local business people that make a living from the country's cultural tourism industry and in turn the economy which has been battered by insecurity fears. Vraiment la crise a beaucoup beaucoup joué sur notre métier. Moi-même qui vous parle, j'étais au village à côté de mes parents. Et quand la crise a commencé, bon, il n'y a pas de touristes, il n'y a pas d'autres boulots, c'est pourquoi je suis venu ici. Il y a beaucoup de, de gens comme moi qui sont ici, qui n'ont pas de boulot, qui sont venus te, travailler avec euh, Abamako. Souvent, ils sont là à, à pousser les pousses-pousses. Bon, c'est difficile, c'est très, très difficile. It was originally held in Dogon country before it returned and moved to Bamako in 2016. Apileno Codillo is one of the many artisans who exhibited their products at the festival this year. In 2012, the blacksmith and the carver left Bandiagra escarpment near Bakuna Faso, the traditional home of the Dogon people, to look for a new market for his crafts and Bamako. After the crisis, the Lord's been in Bamako here. They started to give courses in practice at the Institute National of Arts, and in the section of sculpture. Et maintenant, au début, c'était bénévole, mais actuellement, on me paye par ailleurs. Je gagne ma vie avec ça. Mmh. 
Now Kodiwa teaches his trade to young people at the National Institute of Arts in Bamako. Wood carving is a staple of Dogon culture and the unique tradition and stories behind some of the work contributed to Bandiagra being named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Kodiwa says teaching and sharing the craft of Dogon is something he was willing to do for free before the institute started to pay him. The Dogon are mostly farmers, but during the dry season they perfected the art of weaving and intricately printed cloth unique to the community. The women spin the yarn while the men do the weaving using traditional hand looms. The Dogon Festival is also seen as a show of resilience for a country considered by many as a peaceful cultural getaway in West Africa. And that's all we have for you on today's edition of Trends Travel. We hope that you enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you again next week, same time, same place, while I enjoy some more of these meals. Thank you.